My guest today, Melody Upson, is a truly inspirational leader. Co-CEO and President of Ireland Investments and Chair of the Board of Starbucks, she's the first black woman to be chairperson of an S&P 500 company and the first black woman to head the Economy Club of Chicago. Throughout her career, Melody called for greater boldness when it comes to our conversations about race and inequality, a national voice as well for financial literacy in the U.S., She's currently spearheading an investment project to bring more black executive and minority executive to the top of corporate America. A very warm welcome to you to the podcast, Melody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. Same here, Melody. So, Melody, you grew up in a large family in Chicago, the youngest of six children to a hardworking single mom who was trying to make hands meet in a hostile climate of racism and discrimination. You've described your mom, I think, as ruthlessly realistic, but someone who never gave up hope ever. <laughs> I think you were the last kid many years behind uh, your siblings. So did you get most of the attention on the country? Did you have to figure out everything by yourself? <laughs> and what was the effect your mother's outlook had on you growing up? It's so funny. I've, I've given that, told that story many times about how I grew up with these five siblings that were so much older than me. And no one has actually asked me that question about the attention. Yes. And it's a really interesting <laughs> and thoughtful question because when you're the last and as far behind as I was, what ends up happening is you're kind of on your own. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> um, the, I think that it actually ended up being this great gift. I didn't get a lot of attention. I know that that sounds crazy because I think people think the baby gets all the yes. attention. My <laughs> siblings were adults when I was born. So you can imagine that they weren't that interested. They had their own lives. They were doing their own thing. My mother yeah. had already had five children. And so at this point, it was been there, done that. <laughs> I have a joke that I only have one baby picture. And oh, I'm wow. nine months old in that picture. Wow. I'm not a baby, okay. you know, a newborn. There isn't a baby picture. So the attention issue wasn't, you know, what you would normally think of if the last child and the last child be mm. very spoiled. But what it did do for me, and this is something that I very much appreciate, didn't understand at the time, but certainly do now, it made me incredibly independent. Mm. Because one of the things that my mom did was anything I wanted to do, she would tell me, you have to figure it out. You have to exactly. make it happen for yourself. <laughs> yeah. I'm really busy. Hmm. I've got all this stuff going on. But she didn't say it in a way of, I don't care about you, because she was very yeah. clear about her love yeah. and devotion to me. But she just put it on me to make it work out. And to this day, I think that was one of the greatest gifts that I was ever given. So basically, she empowered you since you were a baby <laughs> to, to figure out the next steps of your life all the time. And, and, and you learn so much, I'm sure, by doing, trying, making mistakes. And and then going back to your mom from time to time to, to, to check to check out. <laughs> and she was just always just very pragmatic. Yeah. She wasn't yeah. she wasn't a coddler. Um, hmm. But at the same time, I know it sounds crazy because it's two distinctly different personality traits. She was still yeah. very warm. Hmm. And so I think as you grew up, I, 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 I listen and, and, and learned that, of course, education was very important to you. And you are actually an outstanding student. You offer places at both Princeton and Harvard, and I think you, pick, you, you obviously you picked Princeton, which was not necessarily the obvious choice, I think, for most people <laughs> at the time, and still today maybe. And then you decided to join the financial services industry. So wh why did you make that choice? Uh, I mean, both in a way of Princeton versus Harvard, because that's not uh, trivial. <laughs> and then how did you pick that, uh, that community of financial investors as a place to go, as a place to learn, as a place to you know, to, to basically uh, make, 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 make sense of your life. <laughs> Again, both great questions. So the first one, let's do Princeton versus Harvard. So I'm this, you know, really devoted student. And I tell people part of the reason that I was so um, focused as a student is I had a lot of chaos in my life. We would mm. get evicted, our phone would get disconnected, our lights would be turned off. Sometimes we'd live in an abandoned building. And so as a result of that, the one thing I could control was school. That mm. was my environment. I can control my output, look, my output, and I could control what happened there. So I became obsessive about controlling that and getting mm. good grades. That was very fulfilling to me and it actually made me feel empowered. Yes. The thing also, so now I'm coming down to college and 
we didn't, I didn't have a family, we didn't travel, we didn't do anything like that. We didn't take road trips, we just weren't those mm. people. And so when it was time to pick a school, I said to my mother, I have to see them. So we saved up whatever money we could. We mm. flew to the East Coast and we took a train up and down the East Coast to mm. go and visit schools. Yeah. This was a big mm. deal for us to do. Yes. And I always thought I would go to Yale until I visited mm. Yale and I just didn't think it was for you me. Like it's it. an unbelievably <laughs> great school, but I just yeah. didn't see myself there, which was a bit dramatic <laughs> and traumatic for me because yeah, I had I'm sure. for some reason yeah. envisioned this. We went to Princeton and that's where I felt I'm supposed to be huh. here, which was counterintuitive because it was in a suburb, not a city. I was from yep. Chicago and <laughs> you know, it seemed like I would go to a big city like Columbia where in New York or or Harvard and Boston. We got to Columbia, my mom said Columbia at that time was sort of in a rough neighborhood and that has all yeah. changed recent in you know the last couple decades. She was like, We're not getting yeah. out of the car. <laughs> and then with the cab. And then we went yeah. to Harvard and I have to say, Harvard was amazing, beautiful, mm. everything I thought of for a college. And my mother really started pushing Harvard. And the mm. famous story that I tell <laughs> is that she kept saying, You could go anywhere in the world and say Harvard and it's like saying Coca Cola. It's, she's like, you could be in an African village and everyone knows what Coca-Cola is. Yeah. And she said, but Princeton is like Sprite. Oh, not even Pepsi. <laughs> no, she said Sprite. She said, it's Sprite is like okay. an American drink. Yes, so she yeah. said, you know, it's different. So, but ultimately I really give her yeah. a lot of credit because mm -hmm. again, she, she was very much, this is your choice. Mm. And so I made the decision to go to Princeton. And I, that was a decision that was great. And there were a lot of people who influenced that decision and Bill Bradley and a, a yeah. alum named Richard Misner. And there were a lot of people. And I thought the reason, the, the, the idea that they would focus on me so intently mm -hmm. to have me go to a school said a lot about how passionate they were about this school, which meant it yeah. must be really special. Then getting to financial services, yeah. I told you about how I grew up. Well, one of the yes. things about the way I grew up, I told people I was desperate to understand money. money I wanted yeah. to understand how it worked. <clears throat> it wasn't about how much I would have. I wanted to live a comfortable, secure life. <laughs> and I thought the only way that I could do that because I didn't learn about money in my family. And in fact, my mom, for all of her great strengths as a person, she was yeah. terrible at money, Imagine terrible. Money. <laughs> because uh, for a whole host of reasons but yeah. because of that that became another focus of mine that i wanted to be secure so financial yeah. services i told people mm. my calling and my purpose in life was born out of my circumstance of course super clear super clear in terms of the inner motivation to to kind of uh, master your destiny starting with financial security that make, makes a lot of sense so you get this very first job, and I think it was an interesting interview process I learned about the way you, you got to this job. And you've been working at Ariel Investment, uh, which is the America's oldest black-owned mutual fund uh, firm since you left Princeton. John Rogers was the CEO of Ariel Investments when you joined, and I think he's been your mentor for many, many years. <laughs> he made you president at the age of 31. Now he's your peer, if I'm not mistaken, as a co-CEO like yourself. But he's also the godfather of your daughters, very personal as well. So tell us more about this very unique personal relationship and partnership you build with, with John. What did you learn the most from him? And vice versa, what do you think he learned the most from you in return? Wow, there's a lot there. So <laughs> um, I met John when I was 17 years old before I went to Princeton. And then ultimately I went to Princeton and he was a trustee of the university and he would come and visit the school every quarter for the trustee meetings. Mm. I'm a student. And so sometimes he would stop and say, why don't I grab, you know, a coffee with you, et cetera. Yeah. And so we started this friendship. I'm 11 years younger than him. He hmm. was a class of 80 at Princeton. I'm the class of 91. He, the firm had already been started. He started Ariel in 1983. And as you suggested, was a pioneer in the space as well as a pioneer in investing in small and mid cap US stocks. Yep. Hmm. So he's an unusual personality. He grew up as an only child and he had these remarkable parents. Huh. His father was a Tuskegee Airman in World War II, the black fighter pilots, and his hmm. mother was the first black woman to graduate wow. from the University of Chicago Law School in 1947. So these were remarkable people. 
And in the Chicago community, I knew that they were remarkable. And my mom had told me that John was this wonderkin, you know, this stock picking wonderkin, even though yeah. the idea of stock picking, et cetera, wasn't something that was something that we knew about in my family. Yes. I yeah. become, uh, I get to know him and cultivate this relationship with him that uh, quite frankly, I worked really hard to cultivate. I tell lots and lots of stories about being a summer intern and sitting with him at McDonald's while he'd read the paper mm. and reading the paper in the exact same yeah. order as him to try to learn and, and a whole host of things that I do did. I think what happened was I was a really willing student, really willing. Mm. And I, mm. I was also someone, he told me on my first day of working at Ariel, that he said, you're gonna be in rooms with people who have big titles and make a lot of money, but it doesn't mean they have better ideas. I want to hear <laughs> your ideas. To me, that is the mm. definition of inclusion. That is including someone in the conversation and telling them you want to hear from them. He invited me to speak my truth. And I say my mm. truth, because truth, that's with a small T, not with a capital T, because I was just learning yes. and, and growing at that yeah. point. It was a pivotal, monumental huh. relationship. Huh. Other than my actual mother and yeah. my husband, John yes. Rogers is probably the most consequential person in my life. Yeah. And he did yeah. have a big effect on shaping me as a person, how I viewed the world of investing, how I viewed being a leader, what kind of company mm. we wanted to have at Ariel. And then this idea that great people share power, they don't hoard it. Mm. He shared power with me. He was always happy yeah. for my success. And then I was happy for his. He never felt that somehow my being, uh, having the opportunity to be big made yeah. him small or vice versa. Mm. And it's interesting you ask about how the relationship has evolved because John gave yeah. a speech recently and he said that, uh, someone said to him, he was asking about having mentored me. And he said, mm. well, the interesting thing about Melody is I mentored her in the beginning and now she mentors me. Ment <laughs> and I think that the roles did reverse in terms of yeah. I started to push him on certain things as I got mm. my sea legs and got very comfortable and had my own vision of what yes. I wanted. And we went through a role of mentor, mentee to co-leaders, mm. which is extremely hard to do because Super it's hard. very hard for Super a men hard. mentor to yes. see you as a peer. <laughs> But that yeah. did actually happen, which shows what kind of person John is. So I, lastly, I'll finish this by That's, saying in a way that hopefully yeah. doesn't sound inappropriate, but I say, <laughs> you know, John and I have a, like, we're like a married couple that where it gets better over time. You know, we've been <laughs> together for so yeah. long, but my yeah. admiration and respect and love for him only goes up. And I think hmm. that allows us to be more successful together in business. I think that's why our company works as well as it does and is able to grow and succeed. And we've defied all of the odds about co-leaders. Oh, yes. You know, very few companies have co-CEOs, yeah. yes. <laughs> but in our world, it really works. So Well, it's, it's amazing. It's actually amazing because indeed, as you, as you rightly said, Melody, I know only of a few companies that have tried co-CEOs and usually it doesn't last long actually <laughs> there's always some people emotional issues happening at one point about big egos taking over uh the others so i think it's been a wonderful uh, opportunity for both of you what what in, in essence to finish what do you think is learning the most from you recently uh, as, a, as, a, as a reverse mentoring process. He actually talked about that very recently somewhere, yeah. and he talked about the fact that with me, he is um, he feels that I had more of a vision around um, diversifying the business, diversifying mm. our products, about um, that we could be in more than one city. He always thought we needed to be in Chicago in one place working alongside each other. And he said yep. that he really did see my vision work in a way that he hadn't anticipated. I think John and I are complimentary in that we're both very courageous leaders in our own way, but we offset each other. Where he's hmm. sometimes more gentle and I'm more tough, it's needed and vice versa. And I think the other thing that where we have we have actually made each other better is I think that he knows because we have a genuine love and respect for each other. Mm. I remember once we had a really big disagreement about something like really mm. big. And it was mm. probably one of our biggest disagreements. And I was fighting hard for my point of view and he was fighting hard for his. And he said, wait a minute, let's stop. And he said, listen, this is what I know about you. I know that you love this company. I know that you would mm. do anything for it. I know that you want what's best for it. And I also know that 
we just happen to have different visions on this one thing. Hmm. And it doesn't mean that yours is bad and mine is good. Yes. They're just different. And since hmm. you know I want the best for the company and you know that you know I would do anything for the company, et cetera, this is no longer emotional. It's just about how we get to the best solution. And I thought those were just very smart, wise, you know, hmm. moments that really did shape yeah. how we even manage our differences um, yeah. because we're rooted in the fact that we want what's best for the company and best for each other. I'd end by saying something that I just think is very hmm. rare that he did became, become chosen family. And hmm. I think even though we are not related, and I had someone very yeah. recently say, <laughs> especially in minority businesses, you often have yeah. families that run the companies. But at Ariel, we're not related, and yet we it, are chosen family like, in a lot of ways. And that is, again, highly, highly unusual. <laughs> but we do see each other in that way, and in our you know dip, most difficult moments of our lives, I think we've hmm. been great sources of comfort and support. And in moments where we needed to have straight talk and someone really push us, we've done that with each other from a perspective of love. Very inspirational, uh, in a way, joint leadership uh, at the top of a company for so many years, Melody, and the way you've been reinventing, I'm sure, yourself, both of you, uh, uh, enriching each other from tough moments as great moments as well. So wonderful. I'd like to go back to, uh, I think, one of the passions you have since, and we understand why now, the early days, financial literacy. In 2009, you set about creating and hosting your first TV show, Unbrock, What You Need to Know About Money which led to regular appearances on the financial segment of Good Morning America. With your TV work, you were teaching people about money management, which is so important, obviously, for a lot of people, particularly those who never got any of that education. You know, in my podcast, Melody also had the opportunity to meet with uh, and have a guest who is, uh, his, her name is uh, Giro Bilemoria. Don't know if you know her. She's a, a serial social entrepreneur from India. She lives now in the Netherlands, and she founded an organization called Chad and Youth Finance International. She's a systems change uh, leader, as we call them in social enterprise. And she has, you know, basically shaped and, and changed policy in 175 countries, works with 64,000 partners. Anyway, driving the same passion you have. So I'd love to understand your lens, the point of view. I mean, where it came from is very clear. I mean, in terms of your family context and why you had to take care of and understand uh, that, that money muscle, master it. But tell us more about how do we need and what da do we need to address that problem? Starting in the U.S., in your, in your, in your home country, but you could expand your, of course, your vision, I'm sure, to, to the world, if that makes sense as well. I'll start off with the fact that one of the things I felt as a child when we were, you know, at our most vulnerable and financially insecure it was literally physically ill. I had mm. so much angst and worry and anxiety about where would we live, what would happen to us. I knew more than any child should know about bills being late and how much our phone <laughs> was and rent and all yeah. of those things. Yeah. And it created a cloud, you know, this heavy cloud sort of lingered over my life <laughs> during those years. So then I go and work at Ariel and I didn't make a lot of money in the beginning. I made $35,000 a year. It seemed like mm -hmm. a million because <laughs> it was the first time I could like Gross. know that I could pay my rent and my bills and all of those things. And I saw the, 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 the sky open up. I saw yeah. the clouds part and I said, this is a different way to live. There's so much more comfort and security that I feel now that I never felt before. And I wanted that for other people. So then I said, how do we get there? Because here's the problem that we have in our society. I stumbled into the financial services world. I started to mm. learn by, about money by doing at an investment mm. firm and ultimately became a student of the markets in a way that I think yeah. has made it virtually impossible for me not to hopefully make good financial decisions over the long term because I've studied the best in the world. People like yeah. Warren Buffett, John Templeton, mm. and others. But also what I would tell you is that I came away with this real sense of, of devastation about the fact that we don't learn about money in school, in America yeah. or basically anywhere else. Globally, And yes. in America, yeah. I give the example that you could take wood shop or auto, literally, 
a class on cars or, yes. you know, whittling. And I always ask yeah. people who whittles in their spare time, no one, but not take a class on investing. And the reason that that is profound and really important is because that class on investing ultimately has profound implications for the rest yeah. of your own yeah. life your ability yes. to pass on money, wealth, any kind of security to your family after you're mm -hmm. on this planet, and how you live while you're here, especially in those later years. And so the language of money to me needs to be taught in the beginning, like children who learn a language very early on. We all know yeah. it's easier to learn a language when you're five than when you're 15. And yet, we don't have these conversations. So I became really obsessed hmm. with this idea of having money be a part of the a childhood conversation. And it's interesting because parents today, especially in the US when they're queried on this, they would rather talk to their children, they rank speaking to their children about sex and drugs higher than their comfort hmm. in talking to their children about money, which is directly so related has, to their lack yeah. of understanding. So situation has changed today, you, you think, in the U.S., actually, despite not just your work, but many other organizations' works happening, or you think you've started to move the needle? Very, bit? very little. We started a school very because little. at Ariel we say, yes. don't admire the yeah. problem, do something about it. Yes. And our school is over 25 years old. We have a saving investment mm. curriculum, and we give every mm. first grade class 20,000 real dollars to invest, and the money follows mm. them through their grade school career with the kids taking over increasing responsibility for managing it. People to say to us, what do you teach a first grader about money? We start with something as simple <laughs> as barter. Do you want a cupcake or a Pokemon card? And then this, the child really has to put a value on one mm. or the yes. other. And yeah, you're helping yeah. them to see how to value things as time goes on. And it gets more sophisticated over time where they learn, you know, small cap, mid cap, they learn the indices, all sorts of things. But it is a conversation that can be had, can be learned. And here's the great thing. Our kids mm -hmm. ultimately get homework that they take home that their parents end up sitting and learning from. And yeah. so it has a ripple effect, a domino effect oh, in terms of a community. <clears throat> And the kids teaching, teaching their parents, parents actually financial, financial literacy, literacy over time. But yeah. there's not enough of this. You know, the one offs yeah. and anecdote, we need systematic yeah. change globally. We oh, need yeah. it in France, we need it in America, oh, we need yeah. it in Spain, I'm, I'm the you. UK, et cetera. Because these concepts, the reason that we've had the financial crisis, the setbacks that we've had in society, et cetera, a lot of it has to do with our lack of knowledge. Yes. That's so that's so true, uh, Melody. Maybe if you're interested, I'll connect with Jiro I was talking about and a few of those other global uh, change makers working on the same issue because I think there's so much to be done in that space. So, but but wonderful to to hear the way you 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 can see the change happening through the schools, but uh, at a much higher scale and urgency as well. Uh, another, I mean, uh, uh, moment I think of, uh, of of truth was one of your. You know, key TED Talks, you had many TED Talks, but one of them, were, I think, was watched by over 5 million people. Uh, and when you were making it almost a decade ago, some friends warned you not to talk about race, arguing that it would make you a militant black woman and hurt your career. But, of course, you ignore those friends. <laughs> and you said, we need to learn how to be comfortable with the uncomfortable race discussion. You want it to be unapologetically black and unapologetically a woman. And you use this TED Talk as a platform to call for people to be color brave and not color blind. Can you explain what you mean by those terms? For again, the global audience we have as well in the US, but outside of the US, from the world, and give some concrete examples of what, what is it to being color brave? What does it look like actually in terms of behaviors, attitude that you like to see happening uh, more often in society? So I think this, this applies to race, but it also applies to other issues like religion as an example, sexual oh, yeah. orientation as an example. This idea of opening up your, your life to others. And mm. the reason I talked about colorblind versus color brave in America, I was often confronted by people who would tell me that they didn't see color. They'd say, I'm colorblind, mm. I don't even see it. And so I started to really push back because I said, in not seeing color, you're not seeing that it's missing in your life. You're not noticing that you're in this homogeneous room with all mm. white men or all white you know, people, yep. and you have yep. no concept about the rest of the society around us. 
Shonda Rhimes, the great um, mm. entertainment uh, genius that she is, who's done all the shows like Bridgerton and mm -hmm. Grey's Anatomy, et cetera, she once explained to me that she doesn't use the term diversity, she uses the term normal. I think this no. applies to many places around the world where she talks about when you're in major metropolitan cities, Think London, think New York, think Chicago, think, you know, Paris. She said, mm. when you're in these major metropolitan cities, when you're walking around the street, there are people of all walks of life, all race, all religion, mm. all sexual mm. orientation. You get into these towers, and as you go up the towers, the higher you go, they get wider and more male. Now, maybe more that's narrow. not true of yeah. India or China, but the idea that the, the, orientation the the yeah. the type of person starts to become more homogeneous hmm. and so i said what if instead of being color blind especially in the context of my experience in america we could be yeah. color brave invite people into our lives who don't look like our, us who don't act like us who don't think like us and who don't come from where we come from where we actually seek these people out in our lives and in hmm. so doing expand our perspectives on what is possible and ultimately open up our own thinking and ultimately make us more tolerant. I think if that were to happen, we wouldn't have wars. We wouldn't have mm. so many of the things that we have, the kind of um, uh, situations that pit people against each other, that shut people out, that, that ostracize them in certain environments, because we would have more of an understanding of who they are, what they believe, and why they believe what they believe. And you can you can be someone who doesn't believe what I could, but I believe, but I can still engage mm. with you and have a conversations with you and learn from you, and that's yeah. the goal of this the, this whole perspective, and that's that idea of being comfortable with the uncomfortable. Generally, we want to sound, surround ourselves with people, ideas. Uh, the situations that make us comfortable, but that's not where we grow. Yeah, I mean, it's so, uh, I think it's so strong in terms of a construct, but it's also, as you know very well, so hard to, in a way, push, motivate people uh, from all of life as well to seek for the diversity of opinions of people in their lives day to day. We'll come back to that later, Melody, when it comes to boards of large companies, which is a starting point. When it comes to investment investment funds, you another lever in your hand, actually, to to make a, to make a change. But it's such a big, deep, uh, you know, uh, societal uh, mindset change that needs to to happen. Uh, so it'd be great to, to discuss further. I know you've been impressing many people around you all along your life, and it's inspiring many people, Melody. One example among many I, I, I heard uh, heard talking about you is. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg, right, uh, who said that uh, you inspired her to write her best-selling book, Lean In, and that her life was altered by meeting with you, actually. So let me ask you the following question, because I know you, you, you like also the, the, the movie world, particularly a, a special one. What is Melody Upson's super Jedi power? <laughs> because you have a super Jedi power, I'm sure. I know you have. What is it? And, and how, if I can expand on that, or did you learn about your very special strengths? And then or do you, or have you been able to build on your strengths, which you know many people don't necessarily do necessarily over time, to build that incredible self-confidence and the ability to drive that success and impact you have in your lives? So let's start with the super Jedi power of melody. What is it? I think I have a couple of superpowers. I think one is that I'm a very, very strong communicator. I'm mm. able to have an idea and to express it in a way that I think can inspire and move people. And and I think in my communication skills, I can do it in a way that doesn't create a fighting words kind of environment. And yeah. so I think that that without uh, capitulating in terms of my point of view. <laughs> so I'm very strong in my point of view, but I'm hmm. also, the give and take is very exciting to me. And so, uh -huh. That is something that I think some people have a strong point of view and then the winning at all costs becomes the, the way that they want to engage with you and they're actually, they're waiting to speak just to tell you why you're, they're wrong. Um, I do, I think I stay open to perspectives. Yeah. I'm looking for better ideas. I often tell people, my board, when we go to them for presentations, et cetera, I bring the idea to them and then I say, shred it. You know, like destroy this idea. Yeah. Tell me why I'm wrong. Um, yeah. I'm open to that kind of feedback. I think the other superpower that I have is that I 
I, I had a friend who said this to me that I'm non-threatening and I'm not threatened. Hmm. Hmm. I'm very That's comfortable perfect. with all sorts of people. And hmm. so I don't think, even though my personality can be such that people will say that I'm, I'm intimidating, I don't feel hmm. that way. I feel like I try to connect with people at all levels, all walks of life, because I am them. You know, I yes. see myself in the eyes yes. of a regular person who's trying to make their way in the world because that's what is imprinted on me as that sort of 10-year-old girl and where so my DNA. family was. That's who I, when I look in the mirror, yeah. that's who I see. I don't yeah. see any of the other stuff. You know, it's like hmm. there's that that joke that people who lose a lot of weight, they look in the mirror and they still think they're fat. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> I still think I'm 10 and that we're not gonna make it. And so being that person just gives hmm. me a different level of empathy, I think yes. with other people, a willingness hmm. to share um, that I think makes me less insecure Yes. I think sometimes the the need to be dominant, et cetera, comes from a point yeah. of insecurity. I think this idea of how did I learn of my strengths and how did I build on them, I practiced. So mm. you talked about my time on television. You know, I would just mm. wake up at to do Good Morning America at th four in the morning. I'd wake up at <laughs> three or two and I just practice and practice Preps. and practice. Mm. I'd get yeah. in the car where a driver would drive me to the studio and I'd run through my script with the driver, <laughs> just anyone driving me in the car. And I said, what don't you understand that I'm saying? Yeah. Because I wanted yeah. the driver in the car, the cab driver, whomever it is. And they would what think I was say, crazy. I'm like, from. I'm doing this, this segment on TV <laughs> on this topic and I'm gonna like read it back and forth. I'm gonna pose the question and answer it and tell me if you understand. If you don't understand what I'm saying, tell me. Like huh. I did that so many times, yeah. I can't, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of times of being on hmm. TV for 20 years. Yeah. And then lastly, I think, um, where does the confidence come? And I, this one is easy for me. My confidence hmm. comes from being studied. When I hmm. am studied in my subject matter, I am very yes. confident. When I was yes. on television, there was a, someone who would watch all of the segments and they'd say whenever they thought I was unsure, and I can now, yeah. I'm trained to hear this you in myself. He you said, your voice yeah. quivers just a little bit. <laughs> and he's like, the average person can't hear it, but we're experts and we can hear your voice quiver. I learned to hear my voice quiver. And then in hearing hmm. my voice, voice quiver, I knew when I wasn't at the top of my game and that I yeah. needed to know something and do more work on an issue. And that became like a really great tell for me for myself of you need to get stronger on this subject. So the, the stronger I got on subjects, the less quivering occurred, yeah. if that makes any sense. Makes tons of sense. And I think I love the way you, 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 you describe, you painted the picture, uh, Melody, about your strengths, the way you've been learning perpetually on your strengths, practicing. Actually, you have to work super hard on your strengths all the time. <laughs> you should never take that as a given. I think exactly as you said, practicing with a taxi driver at 3 a.m. In, in the street of Chicago, New York, I guess it was. <laughs> and it's wonderful to see the way, uh, in a way, the, 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 where you came from is you propagate that through the, the connection you have with people, uh, creating that empathy and creating that openness of uh, embracing the other's point of view to bring them together, hopefully, or to move somewhere together, uh, depending, of course, on the topic of discussion at the board level, as much as uh, in, in the cab uh, car as well. Uh, so uh, wonderful uh, way. It actually resonates very much with me on positive leadership. It's the first circle where we talk about myself and the way I, I get to know myself. I become more self-aware, more self-confident. And I drive all my positive energy from physical to cognitive to, uh, to social emotion I have and to kind of master that, I don't know if it's a proper word, but to manage it properly so that whenever I connect with anyone, the taxi driver, one foreigner in the street, as well as the CEO of that large company, I, I, I connect in a deep, authentic way and I'm propagating uh, that inner positive energy I have in myself. If that makes sense for you. It That's does. <laughs> I call it confident humility. Yeah, I love it. You know, those are the two that. words I put together on that. Yeah. And the way that I, the other thing I should say, the one way that I think I've built on my strengths, I call it rag radical accountability. Like wow, to be radical to, accountability. To really yeah. be intellectually honest with myself and hold myself accountable for what hmm. the, I don't do well. I really, hmm. I don't, I think a lot of people make excuses. I do agree. It's, uh, it's easy for all of us, uh, I would say. 
to make excuse for uh, for mistakes or challenges we, we didn't handle well. Let, let me build on that uh, fascinating discussion about, again, your mindset. I think you've said you are not a victim. Uh, instead, you try to be a victor. <laughs> you, have to decide, you have to decide how you're going to show up in your life. And at one point you said, I've used some of my differences as a way to stand out and to hopefully count and matter and hopefully create an opportunity for others. So I'd love to understand the way you've been learning uh, along your life, Melody, in particular the way you learn through feedback, including what I'm calling tough love, right? We all have sometimes tough love moments with people we love the most, actually, or sometimes people we don't even love, actually. <laughs> and how do we, or have you learned through the, the loop of feedback from others? And or are you yourself giving feedback to other people? Because I'm sure they expect a lot from you as well, or maybe not. But I know this is an art. So t tell us about the art of, of, of getting the feedback, learning the feedback, and providing a feedback to others. This is a big issue, and it's one that I think is very important, and I think it's how you grow as an individual. Feedback has been very, very important to my development. And one of the things, that, you know, you're not entitled to feedback in your life. My friend Dembi Samoyo said that to me once. You don't have a right to it. So when you get it, it's a gift. Instead of thinking I'm entitled to feedback that someone's supposed to tell me, I have to invite that into my life. And I invite that into my life all the time with my friends, with my mm. family, et cetera. I think a lot of people walk through the world with blind spots and they, they, they have people around them who enable them to have those blind spots exist in a way that is yeah. detrimental to them. I do not want to be one of those people. I genuinely and, and with every fiber of my being mean that because I've been with so many people where I've seen that and I'm like, why won't anyone tell them? <laughs> you know, this is like <laughs> holding them back. It's keeping them from being their best self. It's keeping them from being well liked, whatever it might be. And so this idea of learning through feedback, I can give you chapter and verse of story after hmm. story of where feedback has caused me to shift. I give hmm. the story of Bill Bradley, the great, you know, um, yeah. Hall of Fame basketball player and U.S. Senator who I met when I was 17 years old. Hmm. I'm starting out my career. I stayed in touch with him. He's, you know, a big figure in the world, ran for president yep. of the United States. And I'm in my early 20s. And he said, you know, Melody, you could suck the life out of a room. <laughs> I'm wow. in my 20s. I'm sitting having lunch with him. <laughs> and I am telling myself as I'm sitting listening to him, don't yeah. cry. Because yeah. that is like what I felt. Like I could feel the emotion welling up in me and the of idea course. that the tears were going to come. And yeah. I'm like a ball hog. And he said, you could, you know, you, you could be a ball hog. He's like, you really could dominate at the expense hmm. of really, hmm. you know, shutting out other voices. That's your personality. Hmm. And so I, I sat there and I was just really taken aback. And he says, you know, I'm, it'll be interesting to see if you can realize yourself and to be a fully developed person. And I was like, well, how can I be that? And he says, it's not that easy. We, we don't know. So I walked away from that and I was deeply reflective. I'm like, hmm. this person loves me. They're not yeah. saying this to hurt me. What can I do with this? Hmm. So I actually literally d did tips. I, I developed uh, hmm. strategies for hmm. taking all conversation as much as possible off of me when I was in certain situations and throwing them on the, on the other people. And I did yeah. that always by asking questions. Hmm. So hmm. It's sim something as simple as, you know, someone would send their assistant down to pick me up in the lobby to go up to their office in the yeah. elevator. How long have you worked here? Where do you live? Mm -hmm. You know, this, yes. that, and the other. I would know 10 things about the person before I got upstairs. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah. you're making it about them, not making it about you. And yeah. doing that over and over again, because I found mm -hmm. people love to talk about themselves. So in, in inviting all of those questions, mm -hmm. I'm hmm. not a ball hog, and instead they feel that, that you really care and are interested in them. And that hmm. was something that just really helped me. The other thing about feedback is, I can tell you the moments where it's been you know, really, really critical in my life, I, hmm. I give one other story, I'll give it very quickly. My husband, and I, you know, I, I joke, I married Yoda's dad, I'm married to George <laughs> Lucas. I was on the phone with him one day. I was at a, a dinner in Chicago. He was out west in California. And I was giving a speech. And there was a woman who walked up to me and she said, you know, I just want to let you know that in the middle of your speech, I'm going to have to get up and leave. I don't want you to think I'm being rude. And this was someone who had never been very nice to me. 
at all hmm. and hmm. had always been rude to me. <laughs> and so my response to her when she said this, she said, I'm gonna get up, I don't want you to think I'm being rude. I said, well, why would it be any different than you normally are? <laughs> Oh, boom. Okay. Touche. Touche. Okay, so I am so proud of myself, and I called George, and I told them his story, and he responds like in just a dead, yeah. you know, pan way, not yeah. being harsh, but being true. He said, hmm. oh, so you decided to be small too. Hmm. Wow. Well. I will never forget that. For, for sure. sure. And I hung yes. up the phone uh, and I was like, wow, I decided yeah. to be small too. Yeah. And wow. that's something that is helpful. Like someone yeah, loves you enough to tell you and then they yes. actually shift who you yes. are. Like it's someone, like, you know, everyone else yes. is like high-fiving me. She's such a yeah, jerk, yeah. you know, this and the other. <laughs> and he was like, you decided to be small too. That's a yeah. gift. Of that course it comment is. Not... changed my life. Yeah. I, I love it. I love the two stories, and I'm sure you have many others, Melody, on, 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 on both sides, actually, of the feedback loop as well, that you got and you, you gave and provide as well. In return no, I have to tell you on been... the flip side of the feedback. Yes. yes. This is what I've learned, and it's, it's something yep. that is, it's actually hard for me because I mm. really do want the feedback, but I've learned everyone doesn't want it. <laughs> so know, it's I like really well for a fact, yeah. <laughs> and that's hard when you're really trying to you're, you're giving it to it them is. and you're you know you're not being harsh it's just like here's some facts you need to it, you it is but 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 the art of learning that you're right in terms of making and, and getting the person to understand that you're here to help her grow uh, as opposed to diminish her to you know to to attack her personally but to have a deep consciousness of, of what the, the opportunity is for her, for him, that's such an art that's so critical. So I love the, the gift you are making to our listeners to seek for the feedback, because if you are not seeking the feedback, you'll never get it. And when you get a feedback which is too superficial, ask for depths into the feedback. Don't accept like... <laughs> yeah. Can I yes, say one other please. thing? You don't, please. you don't take put conditions on feedback. So what happens right. a lot of people, they say, well, I don't like that person. So therefore they dismiss it. I don't respect they them, dismiss. they dismiss it. We actually have a, a saying at Ariel, you take feedback from whomever, wherever, whenever. You know, you don't <laughs> decide because you like the person that the feedback matters to you or doesn't. You're asking yourself, no matter who it is, what, instead of dismissing it, what could be true about what this person is saying? Now, maybe there is no truth there, but you start from the position of there's some truth there. Yeah, no, it's so, it's so true. Let me, let me shift gears, Melody, if you don't mind, based on all this incredible learning uh, feedback loop you had all your life and you keep having, I'm sure, like, 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 like I do uh, enjoy as well myself. I'd like to come back to this uh, challenge and opportunity you see where today only six black CEOs sit at the helm of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, barely making 1% of that group, which is a tiny amount. And in 2020, in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd, I think in response to Jamie Dimon, a CEO of JP Morgan, you came up with a very special plan called the Project Black, which is the first private equity initiative or investment. Tell us more about where and how you shaped the plan, where, the, where this idea came about the plan, and what you're going to do with that investment to change corporate America or global, maybe, uh, <laughs> corporate world as well. Yeah, so during the civil unrest that was occurring in our country, the summer of the murder of George Floyd, the vicious murder, Jamie called me, I'm on the board of JP Morgan, and he said, you know, Melody, a lot of people wanna help black business. And he was toying with some ideas of bringing together black investment firms like mine. And he said, you yeah. know, Ariel could be a part of this. And he started naming firms. And I kept saying to him, Jamie, mm. that firm's out of business. They're gone. Nope. Don't exist. And it made the point of where we were as mm. a society. And I said, I think I have an idea. My idea was born of an, uh, a perspective that there's an emphasis around the world that in order yeah. to spur and grow minority businesses or, you know, emerging markets, whatever you may, mm. what have you, that this access to capital becomes fundamental to the growth of the business. My co-CEO, John Rogers, always used to say to me, access to capital is important, but access to customers is more important. And I gave the example as I sat there and thought to myself, if you have a fist full of receivables, JP Morgan will lend you money. 
So I said, yeah. how do we create a world in which we can bring capital and customers together to scale change mm. in our society around black and brown businesses and therefore help narrow the wealth gap that exists in this country, in America specifically? Because 95% of minority businesses, that's businesses run by black or has yep. Hispanic uh, leaders, yep. those businesses have less than $5 million in revenues, Wow, 95%. Wow. At the same time, during the George Floyd um, mm -hmm. summer of unrest, a lot of corporations were saying that they were literally trying to diversify their vendor list, both literally and figuratively. Literally yep. because of the supply chain disruptions because of COVID, and figuratively mm -hmm. because they were not diverse in terms of the types of suppliers that were um, supplying yep. them with their needs. So I said, what if we create an opportunity for black these black and brown businesses to be scaled, to be tier hmm. one suppliers? Because the problem that we have is that if you have 95% of these businesses have less than $5 million in revenues, they're not you know, big enough to do big business with the giants. We'll never scale, yes, for the large guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea would be that we would go and buy these businesses that hmm. may not be black or brown when we buy them, but my hmm. word, they become minoritized through our ownership. Businesses with, with between 100 million and a billion dollars in revenue, where we install at the C suite level at least one black or brown leader mm. who's CEO, CFO, COO, a majority minority board in the US. And then also where we would also uh, seek to share equity throughout the organization and when at all possible, where there's opportunity for growth of expansion of those businesses to do so in disadvantaged minority communities. So again, to bring the opportunity to communities and again, hmm. from that perspective, help narrow the wealth gap in this country. We called it Project Black because I wrote this yeah. memo to Jamie yes. and in the spirit of investment banking, I gave it a hmm. pseudonym. But I thought yeah. that's a good enough name for the endeavor. And so the fund, which just closed, is called hmm. Project Black. I think you just closed $1.4 billion, right? 1.45. 1.45, sorry, let's be precise, sorry. And very sizable. I love the, the way you think about not just access to capital, but actually also to people leadership, changing the mindset and the types of leadership we have in companies and customers. At the end of the day, it's about selling, driving also that, that, that supply chain in a, in a much higher scale. No, I know our time is counting, Mel Melody, just last couple of questions. You're also sitting clearly in a number of boards, including, of course, being uh, the only black woman as a chairwoman of Starbucks, and uh, star, star, chairwoman of Starbucks, and, what, and, the, and the only one, I think, still in the top 500 Fortune companies. Not the first, companies. though. I'm the second. Ursula Burns second. was the executive chair of Xerox. I'm the first non-executive chair of a Fortune Sorry. 500 company as a black woman. Thanks. Thanks for the precision. So what are the three steps that CEOs and chairmen and board directors, shareholders should take to change this? Well, first of all, I think that there are, um, you know, I keep saying that uh, we have to put elbow grease behind the lip service. You know, there's a lot of yeah. lip service around this of in stating intentions. But as Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. This is the one area where leaders are often trying to get credit for just an effort as opposed to results. And I think we have to hold ourselves accountable in terms of results, in terms of diversity in the C-suite amongst executive leadership team, in terms of diversity amongst suppliers. Are we fair and equitable in, our, in the ability of companies to do business with those businesses? And I think also at the same time, really as just using that example that I gave with John Rogers inclusion, really mm. you know making a commitment we had a i give a story about one of our friends was running a big city newspaper and they were doing a special edition for an anniversary of the city i think it was the 100th anniversary and it was a majority minority city yeah. meaning that the vast proportion of the city in this country was uh either black or or hispanic right. And in that situation, he has he assigned one of his best reporters to do a special section for this 100th anniversary. And when the reporter came back, he said it was the only time he had ever stopped the presses at the company. Because once he got the special section as a courtesy thrown on his desk when it was done, he opened it up and he leafed through it and not one person in the special section that was highlighted was black or brown. 
And so he hmm. stopped the presses. And he said he knew that the reporter was a great reporter. It was two reporters, in fact. He said hmm. there was nothing about them that was inherently biased. They were just writing based upon their own personal experience. And it led him to ask a very simple question. And I think all companies could ask themselves this question. Is everyone hmm. in the room? Hmm. So he said he realized that if he had had more people in the room when that special section was yeah. being put together, it would have come out very differently. More voices and more representation would have been there and it would not have been so one-sided and hmm. therefore not really reflecting the society that they lived in. And so I asked yeah. CEOs to say when they're you know, in there with their strategy Please. teams or making big decisions or whatever it is that they're doing, is everyone in the room? I, lo I love that statement, and I'm afraid this is going to be the last question, Melody, because I know you are, you have to, to move. My very last question, I mean, you and George Lucas are building an amazing uh, museum of narrative art, which is all about storytelling across many kinds of arts and disciplines. My last question is more about what is, a, what is the most important story you want to tell, not to the world, but, but to, to your daughter, Everest? What is the story you want to leave with her uh, in terms of you know, uh, I'm not saying your legacy, but in terms of your basically uh, uh, the most important probably story you want to 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 leave with her. I have thought about this a lot. And so first, I want her to be kind. I want to be her mm. to be someone who cares about other people. That is really, really, really important to me. The mm. second thing that I tell her is based upon what my mom used to tell me, but I've amended the, the way that I say it. My mother used to tell me that, Melody, you can be or do anything. I believed her. What I say mm. to Everest now is, Everest, you can be or do anything. But I want you to believe that is true of anyone and everyone. I want mm. when you look out into the world, whoever you see, from a cab driver to a janitor to the lunch lady to a CEO to an anchor person on television, that you believe all of them can be or do anything as well. I think if we have that lens through which we view society, we'd be much more open to people and all of their possibilities. I love that signature melody and I enjoy so much our discussion today. Thank you so much. Uh, again, a uh, thousand of thanks uh, from Paris to you. And I wish you a wonderful day and a wonderful uh, life and lives. Thank you so much, Melody. Thank you.